Today, I'm talking about inspiring joy in the library ecosystem. And I don't know, I'm sure when everyone heard that theme, because I believe it's the theme of the upcoming conference, it's the, it's a theme. And we all, and we all probably looked at it and went, huh, okay. Um, because I love it, I really do. But it did take me a minute, because joy is not a word that I'm normally associating with sort of professional development and conferences. And so I am a word buff. I love words. I annoy my wife because I look at etymology of words and I say, do you know what that means? And she's like, I know what it means if you tell me what it means. <laughs> right? um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit more time on that word that is interesting. It's also appropriate because we're in gingerbread season and we're seeing it everywhere. And it's showing up on, you know, it's all around my house with garland around it. And I wanted to spend a little time thinking and talking about joy. And so as I began looking at this word, I found some sort of obvious things that probably have already been discussed today, so I apologize. But I did make a discovery. The discovery was not that there's a noun form of joy. It turns out there's a noun form of joy, which is kind of like, yeah, I have joy, I give joy, joy is with me, of joy, whatever, right? The sense of happiness, tears of joy, a thing that can cause um, joy, the joys of Manhattan, etc. So far, so good. Pretty easy. Dave, didn't come here for an English lecture, but stick with me. What I didn't know is that joy can be a verb. This is honest God, which is to rejoice. I felt shame that I ever joyed in his discomfort of pain. That might be the most passive aggressive example of a definition I've ever seen. Right? It's not like I went out and joyed. It's like, no, no, I really, he was miserable and I joyed in it. That's right. We'll stick with that for a minute. However, and I have to be careful, but I am in Texas, and it is Christmas season, so I think it's okay if I bring up the religious use of joy, which is a really interesting, coming out of the, the Jewish tradition, coming out of the Christian tradition, that joy is seen as a gift and a choice in the face of trial. That you choose joy, that you take on joy. So I, I looked at this and I thought, that's a really interesting, very appropriate use of this word right now in this profession. So what I want to do is I want to sort of walk through those concepts and tell you things you already know. That's kind of my job. So, once again, narcissist, funny hat. It's all good. So, time of trial. The idea of a choice. And the idea of a gift, and it's not just a gift, but it's a gift from a larger force, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So, starting with the obvious, which is in the time of trial, and starting with the obvious, we're in a time of trial. This is really a keystone moment in our profession. And we are, I think, now at the beginning of the end of this moment. I really do believe that. I believe, I know I'm also an optimist, but I believe this, these things, when I first moved to Texas, in fact, when I met Gretchen, we were having a plan meeting, my plan colleagues, we were meeting a plan meeting, and I was just blown away by librarian after librarian talking about the horrors they were going through, talking about the trials they were going through, and it was remarkably upsetting, right? We went from a position of the librarian was either benign neglect, right? Oh, you're a librarian, how nice do you read? Or, oh, you're a librarian, do we still need them? Or, oh, I love libraries because I love to read, you must do that all day. Two, we're groomers and we're pedophiles. And that was a really quick transition of which we were completely unprepared for because human beings are completely unprepared for that kind of assault. And so there's a trial. And the reason I say well, I think we're at the end of the beginning is not because it's done, not because this is all gonna go away, not because we don't, as I will talk about later, have legislation that we have much to do about, but we're at a point now where the shock of it is beginning to subside. Where those who mobilized to use this, and once again, we can have discussions about the trials here in terms of, you know, for political gain, not political gain, them outside, studying that stuff for a moment. We're past the shock of it, and we're now to the point of response and we're now to the point of considered response. Because the initial response of, no, not me, turned into, we don't censor anything ever, anywhere, all the time, forget it, which has now come into, what is our role within the community? And what is our role as professionals? 
once again, whether you have, I believe that there are three ways to become a librarian. By degree, that keeps me in job, we'll keep doing that. By job title, congratulations, you're the librarian, right? For good. And by spirit, that we know many people out there that are librarians, not just because they have a well-organized nightstand full of materials alphabetically organized, or the kind that take physical pain when they see people organizing books by color. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, and I believe the idea in sort of folksonomies and local collection strategies, but even that's like, oh no, that's a step too far. Or worse, did anyone see organizing, putting books spine in first? What the hell is that about? <laughs> okay, anyway, so librarian by spirit, you get my point. We have a lot of them. In fact, I think, and I'm not very familiar with our current mayor, but I, I was in this room when they were starting the strategic planning process and the former mayor came in and eloquently spoke about the power of libraries and what they could do with an Austin. And I was like, librarian by spirit. We have these people who really truly believe in the idea of helping and building our communities through knowledge. Right? I think we heard a little bit of that just in our previous speaker. Right? That idea of how we can make this impact. So we're to the point now where we're being able to talk about that's professionalism. We provide a vital service. It's not just whoever gets to yell the loudest. We now have services and collection development policies and we now have law. We now have three for three cases where the law is on the side of how librarians work, right? So we're in a place where we do have to renegotiate, as any dynamic profession does, renegotiate our role within the community. One, to highlight that it exists. We now are seeing that this is an important thing. I mean, if anything else, the attacks on libraries have gone from your quaint and your obsolete to you clearly have control over the youth of America. <laughs> I mean, think about the investment of power that these folks have given us. I have chosen this book. <laughs> we, we really, we, we moved from cats being associated to, to, to libraries to like us sitting and stroking them in a chair, looking out as our control. And, ah, you want gender queer, Mr. Bond, right? Whatever it is. So we're moving around this, but it is a time of trial. And to me, the time of trial, it, this was where it started. Loud voices, public meetings, organized, understanding that, by the way, these are um, techniques that were developed during the 1930s and 1940s by people like Saul Alinsky and the radicals are being used in this area. We've moved past that. And to me, we've moved into a more dangerous area, which is the trials no longer come from the loud voices in our boardrooms, they come from loud voices in our legislatures. This, to me, is a really interesting moment. And it's a dangerous moment because now we're looking at power. Now, communities, whether they're a community of where you live, a community of where you study, a community of where you work, a community of where you teach, our communities have always had power in our libraries. We have always sought to make our collections and our services reflect our communities, but also reflect all of the community and to enhance the community. Right? If all we were doing is giving the community with them. My mother, whom I love, lives in a tiny little village outside of Cincinnati, Ohio called Glendale, Ohio. Cincinnati? All right, very good. So I grew up in Cincinnati. To let you know what this, and, and I'm just going to tell you, uh, let me put my silver spoon right here on display for a moment. Glendale is where, if you've ever heard of the company Procter & Gamble, it's high, right? Glendale is where Procter & Gamble lived, and they built a train track from downtown Cincinnati to Glendale so that they could go back and forth every day. It's like this little piece of greenery on a map, which is all, all right? So, fair enough. <laughs> Around Glendale, there are about like 10 different public libraries. But to be a good community, they needed a library. So of course, they built a the library. They didn't actually build, they took a community center, and they were gonna have a library by volunteers. And what did they do? They went to the community and said, we're building a library. And what they asked for was not money, they asked for their used books. So they filled this community center full of used books. And they sat patiently waiting for people to come borrow their own used books. And ironically, <laughs> they didn't come. It didn't work that way. So we've always known that our collections and our services and our materials is not just about being like the community, but to challenge and force the community to be better. 
to improve, to learn more, to make smarter decisions, to find meaning. Right? That's what it is. And this concept of neutrality and unbiased and objective, throw it away. Because the other good point, and I think there are good points to these trials, is that we've learned that the, what we used to call neutrality, objectivity, and bias was not true. At best, it was a reflection of a majority narrative of the world. And what we have found, though, is when we say things like for all, when we say things like collecting a controversial material because communities need to be informed, we've been, as we've begun to restate our principles, we've gone away from the idea that we are sort of metaphysically neutral, that somehow just we're granted as librarians we are now neutral. It's a very passive concept. We are not. We are for the improvement of all communities. We are inclusive. That takes activity, it takes action, and it takes justification, and it takes law, and it takes thinking, and it takes advocacy, and it's not just a natural state that's accepted. And I think that's a positive thing that has come out of these trials. We now know that, for example, the vast majority of the US population opposes book bans. We've now, and to me, the most brilliant and wonderful things about all of this has been watching school children from very young up to 18 year olds get up, show up in front of board meetings and say, you know, good people don't ban books. History does not look well on banning. Right? We've seen this mobilize our community. One of the challenges we have is what do we do with a mobilized community? How do we take advantage of this discussion? I'm looking at one of my Lano heroes in the audience, right? We started this conversation, we've gotten people together. We've gotten them in reaction to something. How do we turn that reaction, that power, that strength of reacting to something, into something positive, into support, into change, into policy? Because this is what the reaction started, right? We look at bills in Arkansas. I'm off to Little Rock in January. Arkansas was a state law that was passed. It was an obscenity law. And what it said is, if you as a librarian give an obscene book to a child, you can be directly prosecuted for obscenity. And by the way, the definition of obscene, yeah, not so much. Not so much to find. It's now currently stayed and in, in, in a federal case. But that was an attempt to say, this is what we do. We, 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 and honestly, we have laws about this. We have laws already. This was about position. Missouri. Missouri has a nice little law that says things like you can't buy sexually explicit books in, for minors in school libraries. Defining sex in a really limited manner. And then it's got this little escape clause that says unless it has artistic value. And so that's also currently under review. And then, of course, Texas. We'll just leave that one there. And then we've got the rest of our day. But in Florida, this is the Don't Say Gay Bill, which is the idea of how representation, inclusivity, diversity, equity, et cetera, can happen in the classroom and how that impacts that. So we've now seen this enter into a legal strategy. Now, the bad news is I don't think we're thrilled with these bills. The good news is most of the bills have been in some way stopped or, or halted because we have legal guardrails in place, mostly at the federal level. The other good news is it sets it in a process of debate and advocacy. Right? It's one thing to have mad people show up at your, at your doorstep and go like this. It's another thing to say, this is the process by which a law gets passed and its input, its testimony, and material. That's a process that is open. It could be more open, but it's open. So we are clearly in a time of trial. What I will remind you, and we'll come back to in a moment, is it's not just us, right? I don't know about you, but I have a hard time watching the nightly news, right? We're in a time of ideological division. We're in a time of war, literal war. We're in a time of refugee crisis. We're in a time of climate crisis. This is a lot. This is a lot. And we had forget that as librarians, we're also human living in a world where a lot is going on that is pressing on us on a regular basis. We are clearly in a time of trial. We are clearly in a time of stress. I want you to bookmark this for a moment. We'll come back to it in a second. So, the other part that I take from this definition, from this tradition, is that joy is a choice. And I really appreciate this. There are speakers that talk about the difference between joy and happiness. 
Happiness is an emotion. Happiness is something you feel. Happiness sort of happens. Joy is a choice. And when we think about choice, we need to think about what is our response to challenges coming before us. And I know you had a session earlier today on AI, so let me do a bad job of trying to repeat parts of it. But let's bring up AI. This is my, one of my favorite pictures of myself. <laughs> I, um, I decided not to wear the third arm today because <laughs> it freaks people out. Right? But this is when people look at AI, when people look at images, this is hilarious. I mean, it's just like, you're like, yeah, 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 it's going to take over the world. I, 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 oh, I should have put this picture up. I thought for fun I would do my Christmas card this year. I'd have AI-generated images. And oh, I'll show it to you later. It, but I said, a family of four. The father is bald with a beard. The, the mother is female with uh, Italian and two boys that are tall. And I swear to God, not only did it have more arms than were allotted, but it had more people. And it had five different people on the picture. And one of the best responses was, yeah, it's going to take over the world. It can't even count. Right? Yeah. yeah. So we got a lot to worry about. But here's the deal with AI. When this is, first of all, let's realize for a moment two things. First, everything right now is AI. Just Everything. If you look at this image, every slide up here has had AI as part of it. Even the boring ones with just text came from built into PowerPoint. In fact, the swirly book at the beginning, I typed into a blank slide, joy, you know, um, uh, joy in the library ecosystem, and it said, how about this? That first slide is literally designed by an AI system built into the latest version of Microsoft. The stupid bullets of choice and whatever is designed by the layout that Microsoft suggests for design criteria. And then, of course, images being reproduced. So AI is everywhere. And this is just what we've seen. AI is in your watch. AI is in your phone. If you listen to Spotify, I don't know if I have any Spotify, Frank. Did you get yesterday the disappointing news of what you've listened to the most this year? I'm a brand new Carlisle. Awesome. But however, my genre is soft rock. And I'm like, <laughs> I, because, like, in February, I had an ABBA moment. I mean, that was, you know, and now, now I'm forever branded as soft rock. Um, it's just like going through Instagram. It's like, you know, for a month, it was just all the ADHD going back and forth, which clearly fits. But still, I wanted to see dancing videos. So, but AI is everywhere where we're getting there. And the and, and other thing you realize is when AI sort of burst on the scene where people could sign up and pay attention to it was ChatGPT. ChatGPT literally just celebrated its first birthday. It's been one year since we talked about ChatGPT, since we've talked about image generation, since we've integrated into Photoshop, since we've integrated into Microsoft. That's one year of task, right? That's a lot, and that's quick. And we have a choice. We can look at AI, and we can say, that's an existential crisis, that's a challenge, that's going to be what puts us out of business? I was just talking to my colleague at Austin, who said that you start any, I'm sorry, I'm, it's the lights, I'm pretending to. Um, you start your, your reference transactions with a chat GPT message, right? <laughs> Is that all right for you to repeat? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, don't tell her boss. She's not here, right? No. All right, we're good. Great. To be clear, it's a brilliant strategy because it identified keywords that you could then take and do other references and databases. And it's kind of the Wikipedia approach, right? It's, it's smart. It's brilliant. Okay. So it changes how we're doing this since all within a year. But it's a choice. The choice is, oh, well, now they're not going to need us anymore. Now they're going to be able to do this and they're going to be that. I have to say I've been really, really surprised in a most positive way that across librarianship and academic and public and schools, there's actually been a very positive response to AI. It's like, ooh, this is cool. We can use this. This is interesting. As opposed to our colleagues in publishing, which are sitting there going, this is an existential crisis. This is going to put us out of business. Did you hear that Amazon, with their self-publishing platform, had to limit authors to three books a day? You could only submit three books a day. Now, let me be clear. When you come up with a rule that you can only do three, that means someone was doing a lot more than three at a time. And, I mean, you know, there's, Daniel Steele can only write so fast. Anyway, and now she really can't. But anyway, so it's a choice about what are we going to do about this technology? How are we going to look at this? I think that some of the amazing positive things we can do in AI 
against when we look at this instead of looking at it as a trial is we can choose to look at it as an opportunity. Storytelling. Once again, I'm sitting there going, every part of this was generated by AI. I was an illustration major when I was an undergraduate. I could never have painted something this nice and it took 58 milliseconds. But now I can use it to prove a point and I can let something else create. I can let ChatGP, when I have that writer's block, give me the first paragraph to at least begin to edit and react to. I can take someone who doesn't have high literacy skills and they can come in, they can enter their ideas, generate a script, input, create an automatic narration, drop that into an image generator, and they can begin to share their life experience where before they were muted by their abilities. That's something different. One of the things that we're seeing in higher education is, of course, lots of new AI programs. Come get your master's, come get your undergraduate program, come get your, right? But what's amazing is they're not in computer science departments. There's now a data science program coming out of psychology at the University of Texas. What they're realizing is what ChatGPT and these AI systems do better even than cribbing your next term paper, they write code. You can go in and say, I'm doing a website. I want this code and it will generate for you even if you've never typed a line of code before. So now when you want to express something, when you want to build a new website, if you go to Wix and get a free website, it says, oh, tell me about your business. Type, 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 type. How does this look? Oh, that's awesome. Right? So it can be used to enhance storytelling, to get our communities to have their authentic voices represented in our collections, represented in our communities, and amplified out. Training, there's a huge opportunity in terms of how do we prepare people to work in this environment? How do we get them to see this opportunity? Small businesses now need everything from the Austin Community College to the University of Texas to their local library to the school library to come in and say, I do business X. I have no idea what I'm going to do in this world. My wife is a travel agent, right? By the way, if you ever get the comment about do we still need librarians, be a travel agent. It gets you. <laughs> of course. Being a travel agent, they also get to spend $50 a day to go on cruises, so it's okay. They, they, they cry themselves over a margarita. <laughs> but and you, my son and I were arguing about AI and how it's going to destroy the world, yeah, as one does. And she's saying that she's finally like, tell me why this matters to me. And I pulled up my phone, and I pulled up the chat to the app, I said, I need a social media post about going to vacation in Greece. And it wrote a piece, the hashtag and generated an image, and I showed it to her too. That just saved me an hour. And that just saved me, right? And you're a one-off librarian. I'm sure we already had conversations with my colleague talking about how you can use it to generate email, right? It saves time, right? So that's training that we can do within our community. And partnering is the important part. Because if I can work with her as a travel agent, and she comes into the library, and I can begin doing that training, she goes, I need to know more. Look, this community college, I know ACC, if it doesn't already, will soon have AI or basic computer science or technology courses. And then, ooh, that gets me really interested. Maybe I can work with the university, either on a degree or research that's going on. Ooh, I can then get mentorship from companies that are moving along in this, and I can now connect into statewide initiatives because every city has an AI committee right now, and there is an AI workforce going on at the state. Uh, level, how can we create a whole Texas partnership? Because we talk about the loss of potentially 18, 6, 86 million jobs within the next 10 years, but the creation of 96 million new roles. How can we as a library community, because we span the entire community, help to minimize the impact and maximize the impact? Think about what other sector, why I love the fact that you're sitting next to community college librarians, next to academic librarians, next to special librarians, school libraries, the public libraries, is we span that whole area. There is very little, and I would say zero, other institutions that have the ability to interact in the information, welfare, and life, and workforce development of this state than any other sector, period. Enough said, done. That's an opportunity. Right? How do we take advantage of that opportunity? And by the way, going back to our trials, it's really, 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 really hard to say, those grooming, pedophile, liberal librarians do a fantastic job preparing our workforce for tomorrow. <laughs> Change the narrative. Change the topic. That's the one part of our previous trial about our communities, is they have taken a library and they have reduced it to one of our one function among many. And even a tiny fraction of one function of what a library does. And in so doing, they have sucked the oxygen out of our ability to talk about how we 
train and prepare, how we educate, how we do information literacy, how we provide belonging, etc. We need to change that narrative. I think AI gives us the ability to change that narrative. There are also some negatives we really, really need to fix. Representation, right? I mean, not just the fact three arms, etc. But we know, for example, if you ask for, please show me a librarian in Ghana, it will probably be represented by a white smiling woman in the bookshelves. Right? We know stereotypes happen. We know representation is a problem. Ethnic representation, legal representation, all these things. We need to work on that once again. What community, library community, spans that different diversity of our communities? How can we bring voice to it? Ethics would be nice. It would be nice, right? We look at transparency, for example. Where is this material coming from? There's a fabulous study that came out of the University of Washington and Stanford. And the study was looking at the role of what they call high-impact human-generated materials, i.e. things under top, books, journalism. And they looked at these large language models and they said, what happens if we start taking, because of copyright issues, these materials out of ChatGPT, out of these large language models? And the quote that I love so much that was in this article was, it begins to suck hard <laughs> as you begin to remove the New York Times articles, as you begin to remove the books and materials out of this and you're stuck with what's basically social media and your uncle yelling at Thanksgiving, it sucks hard, right? So how can we talk about ethical use and reuse of this material? How can we look at the documents and digital documents we're sitting on top of? How can we make sure that they're representative? But perhaps the biggest question how can we look at this technology as a way to solve and not exacerbate an isolation issue? Stick a pin in that for a moment. So pin number one, the world sucks. Pin number two, AI needs some help. Number three is of this concept. It's a time of trial, check. We have a choice of how we're going to respond to it, check. We have power. I mean, take, once again, take my previous speaker for a moment. Did you hear in his voice, besides brilliance, and I'm not going to attempt to rap, did you hear the reverence he had for it was in the library? It's in the, I was at the library. I, right, our communities, there's still a lot of prestige. And that we need to talk about, once again, joy coming as a gift. And this is where, you know, if we think about for a moment in the religious tradition, and I know it's too small to read, it would be talking about communion, a gift from God. That in essence, um, St. Paul writes about, it is wonderful to live in a time of trials and receive the gift of joy from God. But if you think about communion for a minute, it's a fabulous word. Because it's the same Latin root that is behind common, community, and communications. It has come from us together. The ecosystem, and I saw the lovely graph of the different library types, we are the source of our joy. Not you, though I'm sure you're very joyful, right? <laughs> but all of us, right? It's all of our ability to call up and say, you just had a bad day, it's okay. I'm dealing with this. All right, one, do you want an answer or do you want an ear? That's always a good question to ask before you hear these things. But we begin to talk about that sort of thing. We begin to talk about support. We begin to talk about gifting ourselves our own support and our own joy. And if you look at this, by the way, I need to take a moment. If you haven't read it, go read this article on vocational awe. Um, Ms. Etra uh, does a brilliant job, and she says problem, part of the problem that libraries have are people like me getting up and telling you, you are a vocation, it is a service, you are meant to suffer for the greater good, that's crap, you should be paid, you, are, you have labor, you have rights, you need support, you, you're dealing with the idea of people knocking on your door and yelling at you, you need to understand that that is an HR situation, not a dedication to the field question. So I want to be really clear, what I'm not asking you to do is suffer, because suffering is good. What I'm asking you to do is support each other, and part of how we support each other is how we manage each other, how we pay each other, and how we recognize each other. So I just want to be really clear that as I'm talking about religious joy, I am not asking you to be martyrs to the cause. I, am, you know, I had a great conversation uh, with Christian Zabensky, who at the time was the director of the Public Library, and I'm like, 
Christian, what can I do about all these, all these book banning, whatever? He goes, well, Dave, what we don't need is another academic telling us about book banning. He says, what I need is I need you to go and find every legislator, every town counselor, and tell them to pay, pardon my language, the fucking librarians what they're worth. So, I just wanted to get, great article, go read it. I just wanted to get that my call is not for you to suffer. My call is for us to support each other. And when you look at how we do it, these are some great examples. ALA's Leroy Merritt Humanitarian Fund is for librarians that lose their job or, or are fired because of book challenges and book materials. If you are in a position and you need legal help, this is a group fund from the library community that is going to their intellectual property office to support individuals financially and in other ways in terms of fighting these materials. This is brilliant. This is community providing joy. If you look at TLA's um, Texas Right to Read, we have a social media post. We're rallying. We're great effort. I mean, I'm looking at a president and an incoming president, and I'm doing what Shirley's doing with Texas Library Association. There's a lot of time spent on how we can back people up. And this is a way that we can gift joy to other people. Talker's work is amazing, but particularly they're collecting all voices where they're doing workshops, talking about collection development, talking about how to support collection development. Every library's campaign where they are a political action committee and they are going and fighting for school board members that understand this, fighting for different materials. We have a community that's doing things. Back to that beginning of the end. At the beginning, we didn't. Now, we're beginning to support ourselves. We're beginning to gift ourselves with joy. Because ultimately, this is where most of the gifts come from, which is the communities that we serve. Let me take a moment, just because I promise to do it every time I'm in this building. Stop calling them customers. Yeah, I know. They're watching. Here's why I don't like customers. I get the idea that we want to treat them well. I get them the idea we want to give them service and make them feel special. We want to give them the best of what commercial services do. But the underlying goal we do it is not to regret more transactions. The benefit of being nice to someone is not they checked out more books. The benefit of connecting and building relationships with our communities is not for some ulterior motive. It is for the benefit of that community member. That's why I use the word member, community member. But call them neighbors. Students, call them faculty, call them friends, call them what you want. And frankly, call them customers, I don't care. But in our hearts, we have to understand that the goal is not more transactions, more connections, more relations. The goal is better lives in these individuals. And what I'm amazed by, why I love being part of this profession, is when I look at it and I look at how people get their joy, they get their joy from that community. Every librarian sitting in this seat has the story. The story is that time that you know you changed someone's life. And you pull that story out when there's a bathroom issue, right? You pull that story out when they're knocking on your door. You pull that story out when it's a late night. You pull that story when you did a great program and no one showed up. You do in your darkest times and your trials, you pull out that story of when that child came and that book that you recommended to them changed their life. That book, that time when you helped a woman escape an abusive relationship by connecting them to social resources. When you talked about talking a group of widows and you created a community for them to come and do mutual support, even though you called it a book club, you knew what it really was. That story, that story comes from them. That's the gift that they give. And they don't even know they're giving it most of the time. That's the power of what we do. And I don't care, once again, if you're in a law firm, if you're in a hospital, if you're in a public library, if you're in a school library, we all have that story. And we need to worry about the community as well. Because just as we look at this community and ask it to gift us joy, and we choose to accept it in a time of trial, we have to also recognize that right now, these communities are in a time of trial. Remember I mentioned about AI and I talked about the idea of we need to worry about isolation? Are we looking at the same organizations building AI systems, Apple, Meta, Google, Microsoft, that also promised that social media would connect us together and instead have exchanged the idea of connection with conflict? 
Where they promise the idea of creating community, what they realize is they can engage engagement. Engagement is a modernized amount of time and eyeballs on ads. They realize they could do that better by getting angry than by getting you connected. These are the same institutions that are now saying, don't worry about AI, we got this. I'm not worried about three arms. I'm not really worried about my bad um, Christmas card. I'm worried that as soon that idea about telling that story, using the AI for people to tell their authentic story and share it, people are going to be able to create a story that they live in alone. We already know that, for example, in gaming, and I, have, I love when he talked about kindergartners. I'm like, well, when I dropped my child off at kindergarten 20 years ago, um, my kids are gamers. And they say it's, it's a different world now. It used to be trying to program a boss, and then what you're really trying to do is figure out where the program has got right. Now with AI, it's tough. Those games have become more engaging. Those games have become more absorptive of people's attention. And then once again, a community that just like you are dealing with what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening with, a, I have a colleague who's going to Phoenix next week. I said, make sure you bring your own water, right? That we're dealing with a climate crisis. We're dealing, our communities are dealing with that as well. We need to talk about the responsibility we have to give joy back to that community. This is officially the most depressing slide I've ever made in my entire life. It is an AI-generated image, as you might imagine. The prompt for this image was depths of despair. And if you're not familiar with that phrase, get familiar with that phrase. That phrase comes from, first, a series of, of Princeton economists who were looking at data. And they were looking at data around mortality and lifespan. And it turns out that since about 1900, the way you define an industrialized nation is by an ever-decreasing mortality rate and an ever-increasing lifespan. We live longer. Now, during the, during the 1918 flu and war, we dipped a bit, but since then, we live longer. And they looked at this data and they found out that starting in 1990, that mortality rate was going back up and the lifespans were going back down. And they began to look at it and they began to say, is this a generalized trend? And what they first found was that in white men, middle-aged men, mortality was going up. By the way, since that, as you'll see in this graph, and these slides will be online, but you'll see that it's not just white males. It is people of any ethnic, but it's middle-aged folks. And what they found in these middle-aged folks is an increasing mortality rate. But it wasn't just that they were dying of heart disease. In fact, part of the reason that our mortality rate has gone down over a century has been heart care. We've gotten better at keeping people alive by giving them statins, lowering their cholesterol, being able to do surgical interventions. We've solved many cancers, right? We've done this. And they said, well, what's, why are these people dying? Suicide? Drug overdoses, complications of alcoholism. What they would call deaths of despair was the increase in mortality rate in our communities were coming from people who were in despair. And they were turning to drugs and suicide and alcohol as a way of numbing that despair. And these numbers are going up. And they kept looking and saying, what else is happening? And what they found is it wasn't white, and it wasn't male, and it wasn't this, and it wasn't that, and it wasn't rural, and it wasn't urban. Turns out it was four-year college degrees. Now, that's not, that's, a, that's not a causation. But what they found is that if you look at the mortality rates in populations with those that middle-aged folks who do and don't have a college degree, they found a marked increase in deaths of despair among those without the four-year degree. Another fabulous book, since we're in the right crowd for this, called After the Fall of the Iron Tower, talks about higher education, because the answer is, I'm the problem. It's me. It's a Taylor Swift moment. <laughs> Before World War II, going to college was rare, and it was considered meritorious, primarily by those who could afford to call themselves meritorious. After World War II, with the GI Bill, which was for the white soldiers returning, soon enough, most soldiers returning, we saw a massive increase in public higher education. College became accessible to all because the state picked up the price. During the 1960s in California, certain governor at the time named Ronald Reagan decided 
that in fact you're benefiting from your college degree because it's set you up for job, etc. So you should take on part of that cost. And so we went from the idea of the state supporting higher education to the state supporting partial higher education, and we released higher education to do what it does so well, which is charge you more and more and more for it. And so we've seen tuition skyrocket. We've seen healthcare skyrocket. We've seen a lot of reasons. But what happened was the myth of, more, of, of meritocracy never went away. We kept this idea that if you go to college and you work hard and you study hard, you get good grades, and you get through college, you'll have a good job. And we have lots of data to show it. If you want to know how to earn more over a lifetime, get a four-year degree. Period. Enough said. Done. It's in the data. Even with the debt, which is horrendous and unethical. But I still take my paycheck and I can sleep at night. I don't know how. <laughs> so we've made college more and more inaccessible. But what we've done is said, not because you couldn't afford it, not because we're charging you too much, but because you didn't have merit. You didn't get your scholarship. You didn't get your top grade. You're not in the top 10% graduating class in your high school in Texas. We've defined college as merit. And so when you are now without merit, growing in middle age with debt, growing in middle age where you're seeing opioid epidemics, you're seeing less opportunity, you're seeing all of these things, you see greater mortality. Surgeon General put out a report recently talking about the epidemic of loneliness, which is connected. Which is not only you're not more not only not meritorious, but in fact you're alone with those thoughts. You're less connected. The idea that loneliness could have the same effect on mortality rates as smoking 12 cigarettes a day has on your mortality rate. We now have actual, honest to God data that demonstrates social disconnectedness directly linked to early death in this world. I know, we're talking about joy. Stick with me. <laughs> I got a pretty picture at the end. It'll make it all better. Think kittens. This, by the way, the, the um, COVID did not help. Be this is, the dark line is it limited, when people were asked about their depression and anxiety symptoms before COVID, 80, almost 80% 80 said they had no um, sense of, and it was a uh, percent of, of adults with depression symptoms. This is after COVID, the light one. Severe, moderately severe, moderate, they all went up. It made them even more isolated. So, what we must ensure when we look at that choice of AI, when we look at the choice of what we do, when we look at their choice of services, we must ensure that the same tech giants that embraced confrontation for engagement, don't use AI to isolate and disconnect. Here's the joy. Here's the thing. Our, for, I've been in this, I, this is my quarter century as a professor. This year. For all my quarter century, I've talked about and built libraries, and been, been advocate for libraries, I've written books on libraries, I've talked about libraries, I've given hymns and sermons on libraries. And at the end of the day, I always come up with vague things like, we make the community more literate, we make the community... Democracy's good. Oh, wow, libraries. Warm, fuzzy, yay. You want to give joy back to our community. You want to talk about the mission of a library. The mission of a library is to save lives. Right? The joy is saving a life. When people come into this building, I don't give a damn if they get a book. I don't give a damn if they sit in a corner. I do give a damn if they don't talk to me. I see, I see Director Weeks has joined us. My first time meeting Director Weeks is he walked me through this building every time he passed a human. I met him, but I walked in at 10 o'clock and I said, I've got a meeting with uh, President Weeks. Uh, where is it? And they pointed at the front door as everyone's coming in, still in days of mask, and he was greeting everyone as they came in. As we went from floor to floor, every staff member he knew by name, or he introduced himself and learned their name, and he knew something was going on. He ran the connected community. Congratulations, sir. It's amazing. Thank you for this day. Gretchen's down in the front. When I went to New Braunfels, you showed me through a beautiful facility, and you talked about the idea of a rec center that was on the other side of town. 
and how this was a place where particularly a Latino community, but a community came on a regular basis, and the question was what to do with it. And the answer was, we're just going to do it. And there was a lot of discussion about, well, is that what a library does, et cetera? And the answer that you got your staff to, which is amazing, is, no, that's a community. That's what we do. We're there. And now you just opened the new facility, correct? Congratulations. Brilliant. I can keep going, and you wish I did, but stick with me, right? As we look across, as you look at your stories, as you look at your opportunities, what you take as, well, of course we make people connected. Of course we introduce people. That's just what nice people do. That is saving lives. What we can talk about, whether it's ACC for people who can't afford the University of Texas, by God, they can come and get an education. And when they're there, they're going to have librarians and they let them know they matter. I can talk about the people going to a medical setting, and when they get the diagnosis from the doctor, the first thing they want to do is search Google for whatever the ailment is, and I know librarians will walk into that room and go, all right, let's do it together. This one's an ad. Crystals are not going to take care of that tumor. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? They walk that through it, and they provide information therapy. School librarians, God bless you, school librarians. I, first of all, you're all brilliant, but I particularly want to call out the middle school school librarians. <laughs> They walk into your buildings picking, picking boogers and then they start to smell and hair comes out in interesting places. And I can tell you story after story of school libraries that become the refuge for the interesting people oh, in yes. school. Right? I, I talked to Sue Kowal uh, Kowalski who runs one in Pine Grove in, in upstate New York. And she said they came to me and they wanted to do a talent show. And I know these kids. I don't have a talent. <laughs> But by God, she did it. And she even tells the story about one kid who was singing and kept backing up from the audience because he was nervous and his head got caught in books behind him. And he's like singing and struggling, whatever. And it's like the best story ever. And if you want to talk about joy, other people's suffering is it. But that kid, after they got down, after their hair was cut away from the book, said, I got to sing. I got to share. I got to tell. We need to give joy back to our communities. We need to talk about choosing joy in what we do in our profession. We need to talk about choosing joy in how we face our trials, and we need to be together to make that happen. But we have to understand that the ultimate source of our joy comes from the communities that we serve, whether that community is where they live, where they study, where they work, doesn't matter. That's where the joy comes from. And we connect them, and it's not just so they get a book or they get a transaction or they read or they whatever. They walk out of this building knowing that they are better and they are loved, for lack of a better word. That they matter. That's the connection we can do. So next time when the budget happens, the next time when they come talking about a First Amendment audit, etc., you can say, excuse me, I'm a little busy saving lives over here. Because we're building and creating the future that we want. We don't want to live in a world where people can censor based on ideological purposes because that doesn't help save lives and connect people who already feel marginalized. We want to build a future where students of all performances and age, whether they're going to universities or not, feel like they're part of it, feel valuable, feel worthy, and feel heard. We want to build a place where community college isn't a cheap alternative, but a great ramp into a future that they can create. We build that with our communities. The reason I hate customers, I'm sorry if you missed that for yourself. The reason I hate customers, you don't build a community with a customer. You build a community with a neighbor, with a friend, with someone who matters, who's valuable, who understands. That's what we're about. And because I gave you the most depressing slide I've ever made in my life, I have to leave you with the happiest one I've made in my life, which is this one. <laughs> Joy. If you want to talk about the trials that we are in, if you want to talk about how we choose things, and if you want to talk about a gift, I look at this room as my gift to me, my origin of joy. When I understand what you do on a daily basis and when it's dealing with the bathroom issue, and when it's dealing with the person who still can't figure out how to click a mouse, and all that other stuff, understand that you matter. And that in a not, not in, in a honest to God data driven, we have honest evidence causal way. You 
save lives. That is a matter of joy. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.